Director of Mizoram University. Um, a guest of honor, Padma Sri Kulatang Palestino. And my dear colleagues, a participant particularly from outside Mizoram, and dear students. I, as chairperson of this inaugural session, welcome all of you to this international seminar on indigeneity, expression, and experience. As you all know, this international seminar is uh, being organized by the Department of English, uh, Mizoram University. Uh, I am very proud of our Department of English for having been uh, awarded DRS, uh, Department of Research Support, and the Special Assistance Program of UCC. And it is the status of DRS that has made this international seminar possible. And <clears throat> now the inaugural session will commence with uh, group singing from students of the Department of English. So now I request the student to come over here and sing.
as well as our invited guests, including our two guests. Uh, as we know, Professor R. Lalu and Plonga, our chief guest, who is here in our room, doesn't uh, need uh, introduction, as we are all uh, familiar with the name and the work of the person. So I welcome you warmly, sir, um, our chief guest into our meetings to our first ever international seminar which will um, run for two days uh, with its theme indigeneity expression and experience and i also uh, welcome uh paul latankala silo who is a padmasri he is our chief guest of, uh, he is our guest of honor and he is already in our minister. I welcome him uh, to uh, this international seminar. He as such is uh, an educationist well known in uh, Mizoram. He is a, very, uh, he is a good such story writer and uh, uh, as I mentioned already he has got potency in 2009 recognized for his uh, contribution uh, in the field of education and to visual literature. But there is a, um, uh, there is a uh, sweet memory about uh, his association with uh, our university. He was a former deputy registrar at uh, Mizoram campus of uh, the New Times. So we welcome you, sir, into our meetings. And then I will <coughs> uh, welcome <coughs> our guest, invited guest, Isterin Kire Anzami. Um, she is our main speaker. Uh, she is located in uh, uh, located in northern Norway. Even though she is. Uh, our uh, much recognized, uh, well-known Naga, but then she is located for her pursuit in uh, literature or otherwise in northern uh, Norway, and she has been invited here. Very fortunately, we have uh, uh, here, we have her here in our midst because we are very apprehensive of uh, an uh, unforeseen weather, but however, we are very fortunate to have her here. I welcome you. And uh, a very brief introduction about her is that she is uh, at once poet, novelist, and writer of uh, children, children literature. She has her uh, uh, one of the awards, like the Hindu Prize, uh, which she uh, achieved in 2015. Her first novel is A Naga Village Remembered. She got her Hindu prize for her novel, Where the River Sleeps. And she has uh, already had a Governor's Medal in Naga literature uh, in 2011. Uh, her poetry that she writes is uh, uh, already translated into many other international languages, such as German, Uzbek, Norwegian as well as Nepali. It is a, a bit of surprise uh, uh, for us that she uh, is a jazz performer. She has her own band, jazz band. And uh, we will get a lot from uh, our possible conversation with her about her association with this band. So I welcome you cordially, madam, into our videos. And then I will introduce uh, um, Robin Gangam. This name is quite familiar, uh, at least uh, to the students of uh, English literature in Northeast. He has been famous, established writer as a poet and a translator from Northeast India. And we know 
that is a uh, 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 that is an important uh, collection dancing or uh, okay i will request uh, uh, i will request rabin gangam to just take a job and coming uh, uh, little earlier madam estreen madam estreen Northern Norway, <coughs> or what place is there? So uh, uh, about uh, uh, Robin, uh, I was going to mention uh, the uh, dancing art and anthology of poetry from Northeast uh, India. Uh, it was published in 2009, and uh, he had uh, uh, really done uh, uh, human service in a way to the students of uh, English literature by compiling, editing. Uh, you know uh, the uh, most uh, uh, writings, especially in poetry, in English poetry, and published this in uh, uh, in 2009, perhaps. And uh, he has got uh, the Katha Award for uh, translation. So I uh, welcome you sincerely, sir, into our midst to grace this. Uh, international occasion and then <clears throat> i will um i will certainly welcome professor uh, lamasai chuango who is uh, the dean of our school school of uh, education and uh, humanities she has been the chair uh, here for this uh, occasion and uh, i will certainly uh, welcome all the scholars participants especially who have come from outside of mizoram uh, for taking lot of trouble to reach uh, here and uh, 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 and i will uh, welcome all professors belonging to various uh, departments of our university and uh, i will also warmly welcome our student participants of my department so uh, if we, i have not forgotten to welcome uh, uh, any who are left out i don't know you will excuse me but then i welcome you <coughs> warmly and with all cordiality into this uh, occasion so that i hope that this international seminar with its uh, uh, good theme in this unity expression and uh, experience will give a good platform for two days to uh, you know uh, come across and experience new thought new uh, uh, new ways of uh, looking at uh, things of our own uh, roots and uh, uh, community uh, uh, community feelings so uh, uh, that is i think the uh, I think I am glad uh, to uh, say in the welcome ceremony and thank you chair for giving me this opportunity. So once again I welcome you and thank you all of you. Thank you Professor Maran. Uh, we are privileged to have Professor Marlon and Flora Vice Chancellor of Mizoram University as our chief guest for this function today. May I now request yourself to deliver your inaugural speech. Chairperson uh, of this function, <coughs> Professor Salma Saeed Salamaw, Dean, School of uh, Education and Humanities, who will come for uh, Salamaw, Professor Farrell, Head of Department, <coughs> Distinguished uh, Resource Persons, Invitees, and my colleagues, teacher colleagues in the University, dear student friends, and ladies and gentlemen. And I'm happy that this international seminar is organized by the Department of English. And I congratulate the Department for organizing this international seminar. As uh, already mentioned uh, by the chairperson, this English department
department is supported by BGC and our SAP program. And they have organized uh, a number of uh, uh, seminars also and workshops in the past. And maybe this is the first time uh, organizing international seminars. And they have also published uh, journals and other materials. They have published uh, books, etc. So I congratulate them on their achievement and their accomplishment. And I am also very happy this morning to see, welcome back to Lokan Father Silo, with whom I have worked in the Mizoram Compass of Nehu for about 10 years when I was uh, looking after the Mizoram Compass of Nehu in 1990s till the early 2000. So he, he was, uh, I was working with him and it was uh, a pleasure working with him. And uh, not only that, I think maybe he is the one who holds this uh, presidency of the Visual Kenyan World Letters, the longest uh, period. And you are still there, I think, president. Even when I joined uh, this uh, Nehu Compass in 1990, he was already, I don't know how many years, uh, <laughs> president of Visual Academy of Letters. And till today, he is still the uh, president. And uh, so I think under his uh, leadership and guidance, the uh, Visual Academy of Letters also has And not only that, not only in ML, as already mentioned by Professor Moral, he has uh, published a number of papers on stories, drama, etc. And I think he is an authority in this uh, uh, literature also. So I'm very happy to see him there in our university today. And uh, welcome particularly, I'll join Professor Moral in our welcoming our uh, resource persons um, all the way from Norway and Netherlands and others, from maybe other places also. And I know it is not easy to come to the Northeast, but we have made the point to uh, come and make this uh, seminar a success. So I personally welcome you. On my own behalf and on behalf of the Mizoram University. Uh, I am a student of science, so I may not have much to say about your uh, topics of the international seminar. So I have told our guest of honor, Ufala, you can take more time because I will not take much time and not from. Uh, Literature, so he can even uh, say something more in addition to what he has already prepared. Because in the program it is mentioned brief address. I think he should be the main address in this inaugural uh, function. Anyhow, coming to this uh, topic of this uh, seminar, indigeneity, expression, and experience. Uh, as I said, I don't have much to say about the uh, aspect. In any case, the, with the uh, dawn of civilization, these uh, indigenous uh, things are, were ignored for some time. So they were, the, uh, they were uh, all these uh, new things, new civilization and new literature and all have come. Not only in literature, in different spheres of life, I think, uh, even the people, the business people uh, themselves are, if I may say, to some extent, marginalized. But now it has been realized that even the business uh, 
people and also the practices of the indigenous people. And they have found out that they are very valuable and so the importance has been given by different organizations also. Even in the maintenance of uh, environment and all, I think uh, these uh, the indigenous practices are also given much importance. So also in the health practices and all. So the importance of these uh, traditional practices, indigenous practices, uh, have been uh, given importance nowadays. Because they, they have long experience. Whatever they cherish and whatever they practice comes from their experiences in science or in research and you may find out some uh, new things which may be very good and very progressive but they are used only for a short time. We do not know uh, what will be the long-term effects of uh, these discoveries and all. They may be find, uh, found very useful, definitely. But in many things, unless uh, you have their long-term effects and all, you do not know what other effects these things will have. So nowadays, these traditional uh, practices and experiences are given importance in different spheres of life. So I think even in the literature, that may be the case. I do not know, as I said. Now, every uh, group of people, whether even in the Northeast, we have different tribes, different groups of uh, ethnic uh, uh, people. So they have their own literature and all, which are coming out of their experience and their feelings. I think they are important. Some of them find a place in the literature, but many of them are still not known to the outside world. And I think even in this uh, English department of Mizoram University, one of the things they want to do is all this uh, uh, literature of the Mizoram or Nordis, they would like to uh, make it known to the world, either through translation or even, uh, I think, in different ways, English or Hindi. Some work is being done. Of course, they are very important, but uh, I think uh, there are certain expressions in certain dialects or languages which you may not really uh, put in English or Hindi because it has its own, as I said, from the background, you uh, it, you can understand what it means. But when you try to uh, translate into English or some other languages, it may not be possible to uh, translate to have the same effect as it, have, it has in your, some dialects or the original language. But there is uh, nothing much we can do, but uh, I think uh, unless you give some uh, explanation what it means and all, you may not find certain words. It's equivalent in other languages. These are, I think, uh, uh, the things which uh, uh, are difficult in translation work. Because uh, unless you know the background, the feelings of the, the people, 
which they express from their experience and, uh, and from their society, the background, uh, unless you have the same background, the same experience, uh, it may not be possible to understand. But I think uh, all the same, it is, uh, our, should be our endeavor to make all these uh, indigenous expressions and all these things, experiences, uh, bring it uh, to uh, the knowledge of the outside world because they are very, we have very rich uh, cultural heritage and practices in different uh, forms, in different uh, walks of life. So I do not know in today's, uh, uh, these two days seminar, what you are going to uh, uh, discuss and all. So I'm sure these aspects also, uh, I don't know, may be uh, deliberated and discussed how best we can uh, make our literature and our writings uh, understandable and also to bring out the original meaning of this. Uh, words and expressions. And uh, we are fortunate that you are, uh, even particularly our students and research scholars, that you are going to have interaction with uh, very well-known writers and cultures. So I hope that these uh, two days will be beneficial to all the research scholars and the students and also the faculty. Because nowadays, nobody can live in cocoon, isolation. There has to be interaction with uh, people around and people from outside and all. And just, uh, we just finished the inauguration of uh, application of mathematics in the mathematics department I came from there. There also I mentioned, in today's world, even in research, I think uh, even the government, the funding agencies are giving importance uh, even in interdisciplinary research and also collaborative research. Because uh, you, you live in isolation, your experience is limited, your knowledge is limited. So you need interaction, collaboration with other uh, institutions, other people to learn from one another. I even uh, what I have uh, from the ministry, from UGC, and from the funding agencies, even for granting these uh, uh, research projects, they give importance to interdisciplinary and collaborative uh, uh, projects. And also, I think uh, nowadays uh, these uh, institutions are also uh, being uh, graded, ranking, and you know, even the uh, uh, government of India is thinking instead of uh, the institutions being ranked by foreign agencies, we should have our own uh, ranking system. So the first uh, thing we have fill up our data during this location, what they call National Institutional uh, Ranking Framework. Even in all these things, I think this uh, research with uh, collaborative uh, efforts and also uh, good research papers are going to be very, very important. Even if you want uh, if you are on institution or on institutions to be at a high level of uh, ranking. So even our research papers have to be of uh, uh, high standard. For all this, I think uh, you need interaction with people who are already well known in the field. I hope that this uh, two-day seminar will be 
useful for all of that. And particularly the younger uh, friends, I think you have to see uh, and also try to learn as much as possible. As I always tell in the uh, seminars and workshops, you should try to not to uh, feel shy and don't let anything pass by without getting clarified if you don't understand. So don't feel shy. You interact with the resource persons and get all your uh, questions answered and clarified with whatever queries you have. That will be, uh, I think, the uh, wish of even the organizers and uh, resource persons. They also have to learn from you, and you have to learn from them. In this world, nobody knows everything. So you have to learn from each other. And I hope that this uh, international seminar will be uh, useful for us also. So I said I don't have to say much. Uh, so I don't say more. So I wish this seminar a very great success. And I hope that uh, the organizers will make the stay of the outside resource persons also comfortable in case you have any problems in terms of accommodation or any facilities. You cannot promise to solve all your problems, but if you bring to the notice of the organizers, I'm sure they will be more than happy to help you with their limited capacity, whatever they can do for you. So I'm hesitant to tell them if there are certain logistic problems. So with these few words, I have the pleasure to inaugurate this uh, international seminar. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for your challenging speech. Uh, the challenge you have given to us, particularly on research and publication, okay, is very, very important. So my request to all of us is, let us take the challenge with us, okay, so that we can bring our university to the level of uh, good universities in our country and abroad, okay, which have been uh, top ranked, which have been ranked in the top in the World University Rankings. Now we are very happy to have uh, Pat Mastri, Latam Palasairo, in our midst today as guest job owner. Now as you all know, he is a renowned person here in our state, here in the Mizoram, particularly in the field of literature. Now I request you, sir, to deliver your brief address to the audience. Mr. Chairman, Madam Lord Sanchez, respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Rosan Juana, Professor Baral, and friends, I am very much honored today to be in your midst, in the midst of educationists, the good educationists. Prepare the future. Who are preparing the future and this, uh, who will become the citizens of tomorrow, the leaders of our country tomorrow? So I am really very happy to be with you. And, uh, but I feel a little bit shy to be in the midst of education is like this, to address uh, the gathering of education is. But I'm really happy and see friends not only from Mizoram, but also from outside Mizoram. And uh, uh, the concept, I'm reading a paper uh, which I prepared for this occasion. 
because I am in Mizo, I am very good. <laughs> but the thing is, I may not be able to express all what I want. So I, it is better, I think, uh, to read. But the first time, the first time, thank you. Thank you very much. Lucy, 
plus 1 is equal to n2 is O. The previous invader called the results Rishai because they put Rishai uh, because they write this Rishai from the word they received from illiterate interpreter and uh, two illiterate interpreter they misspelled also the name and so they put it to side. Actually, it is only one of the clans of the result. You see, it's one of the clans of the result. And the literate interpreter put it to side, and the British has also uh, wrote it as to side. So it is actually equivalent to result. However, the claim of the success paragraph, next paragraph. However, the claim of the success of the British expedition did not last long. On 2nd October, February 1888, Lieutenant Stewart and his men of small party of survey operations were killed and the heads of the victims taken away. In January 1889, 24 villages were raided 101 persons killed and 91 carried into captivity. The number of assailants who belong to Silu, that also means the silo, silo type being estimated to 600. And well. Again, what? Forbearance was no longer possible and it was determined to employ. What remained of the cold weather in the organization, in the organization and despots of primitive, made, primitive force, unquote. What was the main cause of those series of raids? To the eyes of the British expansionists, those raids were acts of cruelty prompted by the desire of looting and head hunting. On the other hand, the Mizor chiefs claim that their lands were occupied by the unauthorized foreigners and that it was their duty to defend the borders and subjugate the culprits. Hence, the conflict arises out of border dispute. Here, I would like to add that Macaulay said in his recite Chrysalis that, quote, the Rushai was not an enthusiastic headhunter as the Nagas had been known to be. Makol was, Makol was the third last superintendent of Rushai. The raids on the so called British territory, I'm sorry, the raids on the so called British territory, the Mizon's claim, was their hunting ground since several years back. They had to drive away the unauthorized foreigners who occupied their hunting ground. Hunting ground was one of the most important vulnerable places for the old Mizos, who firmly believed in the existence of the abode of the soul in the world hereafter. To enter for the soul into the abode of beasts, he had to kill a certain number of beasts. Now, certain precise number of beasts. A vast land covered with thick forests was required for the different world animals grazing. Grazing ground. The priests did under the destroyed the forest, which the Mizons valued so much as their hunting ground. The laborers who settled in the nearby tea gardens, which the Mizons considered as in tortures were to be given away. Hence, they were the victims of rage. Those victims were, all the British officials claim, settled within the British territory. As a result of British government of India decided that operation should take place, the object of which should be as follows. One, 
punitive measure. Two, to subjugate the whole tribe. Three, to open communication between Parma and Bengal through reserve run. And four, to establish semi permanent post to ensure complete pacification and recognition of British powers. The primitive method of resistance, that is from Mizoka, from the Mizos, that with resistance from the Mizos, was no much to the British slide. The result was the long British rule over Mizoka from 1890 to 1948, I'm sorry, 47. During the long period of British occupation of Mizoram, the land was not much, uh, I'm sorry, there was no much development work. However, the Mizoram who were wholly illiterate found their language reduced to writing, and the percentage of literacy was fairly high and satisfactory during the British period. The pre British internal field between cyber thieves came to an end. Peace and tranquility prevailed. Hence, the Mizos, in spite of their backwardness and poverty, were quite happy and loyal to the British rule. Good. Darushai, Darushai Hills is an excluded area under the British Government of India Act 1935. The term excluded here implies that Yushai is outside the control of provincial legislature. Up till 1935, the hills were administered by His Excellency Nigatol of Assam, Green Council, the subject of backward areas being termed as a reserve subject for His Excellency's special interest. Unquote. In the absence of responsible representative, no fund had ever been allotted for development downward, although the hills were to sub subject for his excellency special interest. No governor except Sarobadre ever visited the land. That was the condition of Mizoram during the British period. Then what will happen in the next period? India, India was moving towards a home rule and would eventually become an independent country, a free nation from the British era. Then, what would happen to Mizoram? Good. The ultimate issue either to join India or Burma or to remain under British rule in affiliation with Mongolian affinities. And good. was the big question. The local British officials under their, the blessings of Sarabadri, the then governor of Sun, appeared to have favored the formation of federal, federation of Hills people of common origin. The issue was the demand for independence to us which would be governed by the treaty for agreement only. In Lusai Hills district, the idea of superintendent who constituted himself the president of the district conference, which he himself had convened, was that the district should manage all affairs with the exception of defense in regard to which it should enter into agreement with government of India a constitution based on this principle was later drafted by the conference and good. So uh, that quotation comes from what is known as the Advice Subcommittee. A, uh, a political party then in the Zoe Union was founded and on nine Founded on 9th April 1946, and a new party was affiliated to the 
with the Indian National Congress Party of Assam. The Missouri Union Party boycotted the DST conference. As a consequence, the demand of the DST conference for creation of a body of independence task was rejected by the religious, I'm sorry, by the Bartoloi subcommittee on the ground that the great majority of Ushai cannot be regarded as holding these views and it is doubtful if the district conference represents the view so anybody other than certain officials and chiefs. Therefore, a new institution, namely district council, was instituted under the administration of some government where Bhattarori was the chief minister. The creation of this council did not pacify the aspiration of large section of his own people in, in the world of Laudena, eminent leader. Peace could not prevail in any part of the world where the right of the people for self-determination is denied. Therefore, this only sort of front movement was started in 1961 under the last leadership. <coughs> the movement flared up into open rebellion in 1966 to subjugate the uprising the government of India sent land and air force. Aizol was I'm sorry, Aizol and several other places were banned by land and air strikes. The atrocity committed by the Indian government as the strike by a long day runs task. Quote, the most unbelievable atrocities, the most cruel and barbarous crimes are being committed every day by the marauding Indian army personnel, Indian army personnel. Wherever they go, bodies of innocent two men, children, and peasants are lying in the fields or in the villages. Even one can find a bullet ridden corpses of Deacon in the church. Women of all ages are sinfully raped, all properties looted, and the villages burned, burned down to houses. Well, the inmates are given at violent point to the concentration camps where starvation of wasting. The Indian concentration, concentration camp. So I shall continue from here. Women of all genesis are sent for the rape. All properties looted and the graces burned down to us as well. Inmates are given at Bernard Point to the concentration camps where starvation awaits them. The Indian concept, I'm sorry, concentration camp in Mizoram are not better, if not worse, than those run by the Nazi government during the Second World War. Unquote. After a long 20 years of insurgency, peace accord was signed by Laudenga and the representatives of the government of India on 30th June 1986. From that year, Mizoram became one of the states of India under the Indian Union. Since that time, Mizoram has become one of the most peaceful states in India. Mizoram is peaceful. But 20 years long and insurgency retard all the development programs. The Mizo uh, regroup, the people regroup in the so called pro dictated progressive villages are under absent poverty without sufficient food and water, clothes and shelter, education, sanitation, and all amenities of life. In that situation, there could be no development. Discontentment, anger, and even the various 
attitude largely occupied the minds of the people who were regrouped in the protected progressive villages. Now they are called these villages concentration camp. Moreover, a large number of innocent people, including students of higher learning, were arrested and imprisoned. Those unfortunate people remained in jail for years without trial, and some of them lost their lives in jail. Many of those unfortunate people have died, yet excess atrocity of the army is still fresh in the memory of the new generation. The present generation prays for law, for order, for peace and stability, along with the protection of their cultural identity as well as freedom from assimilation. It is their desire for the unity of all the results within and outside the country of Mizoram. As already pointed out, India is a great country with vast land and enormous people. Uh, enormous people. Therefore, the interests of a small, unimportant, and unimportant land occupied by indigenous Mizo people is likely to take a very secondary place. The indigenous people of Northeast India are desirous of special treatment, namely special status, as to enable them to join the mainstream of national life. The ultimate solution of the problems of the indigenous people of Northeast India is therefore the big question of the day. Thank you. My eyes does not help me today. But come in Bhutan, we talk about it. In Gai Gambonia, that's here to talk about it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Padma Sri, Ula Thakpala Silo, for your speech that is focused on the main theme of this seminar that is indigenity, expression, and experience. Uh, now, before we go to the last item, um, Professor Karal, what can you take a few minutes? Again? Just a half a minute, if you will. Uh, actually, my uh, department, uh, as you know, we are organizing this national, international seminar for the first time. And uh, its coordinator is uh, Dr. Seri Changte. Will you please stand up? Now I will come to uh, introduce uh, Professor Margaret Chojama. Uh, uh, she is our senior most uh, faculty. And uh, under her guidance and uh, her coordinatorship, uh, this uh, SAP uh, DRS1 is running and uh, as uh, already it is uh, uh, known to you that this international seminar is sponsored by DRS Asaf and Professor Jama is there in this for quite some time uh, this Asaf DRS. And uh, next I will uh, introduce my senior colleague, senior faculty of my department, uh, Dr. Lalrindiki T. Fanai. She has been sitting here. Please. And next, I will also introduce uh, uh, Dr. Casey Lakla Mwani. Uh, and uh, our uh, Dr. Christina Jama. And Dr. Dhanadit uh, Singh. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And another, uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting to uh, introduce our uh, professor, uh, Margaret uh, Pachual. She's outside, She's outside uh, doing all the hard work. For <laughs> so uh, this is our faculty. Okay, that's
धन्यवाद टू थिंक प्रोफेसर मार्गरेट चौजांगा इज कोऑर्डिनेटर ऑफ डीआरएस सब वन एंड डॉक्टर लर्न जिकिटी फानाई इज को कोऑर्डिनेटर ऑफ डीआरएस नाउ डॉक्टर शेरी एल चंगते कन्वीनर ऑफ दिस सेमिनार विल प्रपोज अबाउट थैंक्स थैंक यू Composing the word of thanks is always a very daunting task, but um, you know, to, in order to organize something of this nature, it's not something that a single person can do alone. And uh, so I must take this opportunity to thank a lot of people uh, on behalf of myself as well as on behalf of the department. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Please bear with me. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Arlen Kantuama today for uh, not only being the chief guest at this function, but also for his support uh, in terms of guidance as well as financially, uh, so that the seminar has been made possible. Um, we thank our guest of honor today, Puh Arlen Kantuala Padmashri, who has been the epitome of professionalism from the first day that I contacted him. He has been a pleasure to work with. He has always been on time with whatever he wanted to submit. And um, there is so much that I have learned from my interactions with him. And so we thank you for the speech that you made just now because you have, I think, opened up a very interesting dialogue that hopefully will be carried on in the sessions to follow. Uh, at this point, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank two of his friends and his nephew who have also um, come here to lend him support. So we welcome and thank you for your presence. Um, I would like to thank the Dean, School of Education and Humanities, Professor Lin Masai um, for chairing this, for agreeing to chair this session, but also for having given us so much support uh, as we were um, organizing and preparing for this seminar. She has run around, made a lot of phone calls, um, done so much for us, and we are extremely thankful for her help. Um, as mentioned, this seminar is under the project that the department is working on, uh, which is you know, uh, shortened as DRS SAP1. So at this point, I would also like to thank the coordinator, Professor Margaret Zama, and the co-coordinator, Dr. Lerindik Fanai, who have uh, given us so much support and guidance. Uh, so we thank you. Um, although, of course, this is a departmental venture anyway, but it is always you know, so helpful to have our seniors guide us less experienced um, faculty members. Um, I would like to thank, again, our special invitees today, um, Ms. Isterin Kire, who has come all the way from Norway, and who has also, uh, this is the first time that we have met. Of course, we have heard about her, we have read her books, we have read her uh, writings, but um, this is the first time that we have actually met. She has been also a pleasure to communicate with, very, very accommodating, and uh, we thank God that she made it because she nearly missed her flight yesterday. Uh, through no fault of her own, because at Balgata Airport, the gate was uh, inexplicably changed at the last minute, so she was waiting at the wrong um, gate, and she barely managed to get on the plane, and the plane took off immediately after, it seems. So we're very, very happy that you've been able to make it. Um, Robin Nahom, who is personally, formerly my teacher, but who has since become a very good friend and a mentor, uh, thank you, Robin, for being here with us today. I don't think he needs any more introduction. We have heard a lot about them, and um, we are hopeful that the interactions that we will have with the two of you over the next two days will be very, very interesting and um, enlightening as well. Um, I would also like to mention Professor Matt Snip, who was expected at this seminar. In fact, he was supposed to have been our keynote speaker. Uh, in case some of us are not aware, Professor Matt Snip is a professor of sociology and the director of uh, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford University. Um, he had made every preparation to come. He had sent us his notes and his presentations. He had bought his tickets. Uh, but for reasons unknown to us, and which has still not been made very clear, his visa was rejected 
last week. And because this was the last minute, uh, there was no more time to reapply. So he sent uh, his wishes and his regrets, of course. And till yesterday, he was trying to find a way to at least send a videotaped lecture um, through the internet. But because of the constraints that we have you know, on both sides, um, he was not able to uh, make it. So although he's not here, I would still like to thank him because he has uh, been so supportive. In fact, uh, he had even offered to pay for his, uh, his own fare and things like that initially uh, because he really wanted to help out. But um, of course, uh, all of that became a moot point because he could not show up. So we're still very, very grateful to him and we hope that at some point in the future, we shall have more opportunities to you know, uh, have him here. Um, I would like to thank all the paper presenters today, uh, people from within the university, from outside the university, some from outside the state as well. Uh, thank you so much for um, your papers and your presence. Uh, um, very sadly, a few of our friends who were supposed to have presented papers had to cancel for a number of reasons, so we don't have everyone here who wanted to come. For example, uh, we have a friend who mistakenly took a plane ticket to Imphal instead of Aizal and uh, is stuck presently in Imphal right now. So, you know, and then we have another friend. <laughs> I don't know, these things happen, I guess. And we have another friend whose, whose train, the entire train service uh, has been um, cancelled for the next two, three days. Things like that which are completely beyond our control. But for the few of you who have made it, uh, we are extremely grateful. Another friend from Shillong, arrived last night uh, by road after having traveled 32 hours uh, because of various roadblocks and landslides and things of that sort. So, um, but uh, we are here and we've made it, so we are very grateful. At the same time, I would also like to thank our friends and colleagues from the city colleges and other places who are not necessarily presenting papers, but who are here uh, to support us as audiences and you know, uh, with their presence. We are very grateful that you have come. Um, I'm almost done, please bear with me. I would also uh, like to thank all of our students and our research scholars for, your, uh, for their presence, for their help. The students, the MA students especially, have managed to put together a choir in a very short time and we have heard them sing. We are very grateful for the effort that they have put um, into this. And also, as well as our research scholars from um, um, various batches who have uh, helped in one way or another and who have also lent their support by way of being present here today. Uh, and of course, although this is, a, like I said, a departmental venture, I would still like to take this opportunity to thank all of my colleagues, all of the members of the faculty of the Department of English who have been so supportive and so helpful, as well as the office staff who have you know, uh, stayed back late you know, in the evening helping out. So I am very, very grateful for their uh, help. Um, I would like to thank the university administration for help in various uh, aspects, which I will not uh, necessarily point out, but especially so the PR cell, the public relations cell, who are today uh, um, providing us with media coverage. Um, and we'll continue to do so until the end of the seminar. So uh, we are very, very grateful for them. I'm, I'm also very grateful to uh, friends and colleagues from across the university, uh, people, uh, people who have come from various departments today. I see friends from, uh, I will not actually mention departments' names because I don't want to miss out anyone, but I do see a lot of colleagues from other departments who have come here uh, at our inaugural session. And we invite you to continue staying with us till the end of the seminar. Um, I'm grateful to everyone else I have missed out. Know that we are saying a very big thank you to all of you. Now, before I conclude, just a few announcements that I need to make. There will be a photo, a photo session immediately after the session. Um, so, if you would kindly stay back, and uh, the, our friends from the BR cell will organize the photo session. I'm assuming that uh, it will take place inside the hall, uh, but let them organize it. And it will not take too long, we hope, but we just need this, you know, as a memento. So um, that will 
uh, that is a request that I would like to make to the Vice Chancellor as well. So if you could just stay back for a few moments uh, for the photo session, we shall be grateful. The second announcement is tomorrow's venue will not be here. It will, tomorrow we will be having our sessions in the Dean's Conference Hall that is at our school, that is the School of Education and Humanities. The so ushers and uh, anyone else, you know the students, can help you locate the place. It is just over there. Uh, it's not very far. Um, so uh, that will be the venue for tomorrow. So not here, but near the Department of English. Um, um, one more thing. Uh, Ms. Isterin Kire has brought some of her books her poetry and her novels uh, for sale, which are displayed outside. Uh, so you are welcome to uh, buy them, have them uh, autographed by the author. Uh, as also uh, Dr. Zod Henry Zodiniana, who has also brought his uh, book for sale at, and is selling them at a discounted price, uh, especially for uh, seminar attendees. So these books are available for uh, sale outside. Um, so that brings me to the end of this uh, word of science. Tea uh, is served outside, which will be taken immediately after the photo session. Thank you so much, everyone. First of all, I will give a brief introduction to Easter Bean. This is the first time she has come to Mizoram, the first time that we have met her, first time I also have met her, although I've been talking about her for quite a long time, probably many people think that I know her personally. Actually, today is the first time I met her. I was privileged to have met her and I'm really, really happy. Uh, Robin, I have, uh, we go back a long way. So, uh, with Robin, he's no stranger to me. Now, Easterine also is no stranger to us through her works. And in fact, I would like to tell both of these two very, very prominent writers from the Northeast, whom we are really, really proud of. You know, awarded recognition published internationally, not only nationally. And we have their stuff in RDRS library. You know, we stock the writings there. Uh, we have a number of your works. Uh, we have Robin's works there also. And we use them as resource material also for our scholars. Many of our scholars are actually working on these two great writers. I would like to call them great writers. And I'm not surprised that uh, Isterin received the Hindu prize because uh, personally I've always been predicting that one day we are going to have the Booker Prize and we are going to win the Pulitzer Prize and so on from the Northeast. And I tell you a few years down the line we will be seeing uh, people like them in the headlines globally. Uh, because of the quality of the work, which is in no way inferior, but in fact so much more, at least in our eyes, so much more uh, superior in many ways to many of the works that are hyped up so much. Now, uh, Isterin Kire was born, uh, she's a poet, short story writer and novelist, and writer also of short stories and uh, children's stories, and she's also a translator. And she was born in Kohima, Nagaland. In 1982, she was the first Naga poet in English to have her poems published. And in 2003, she wrote the first uh, uh, English novel to be written by a Naga writer that is, that was, that is known as a Naga village. And uh, this Anaga village, remember, this was in 2003. In fact, it's, uh, you know, a really, uh, it's a landmark because in not only in Naga literary history, but also in the literary history of Northeast writing uh, for those writers writing in English. Her novel, uh, yes, in 2011, let me just go chronologically, uh, she was awarded the Governor's Medal for Excellence in Naga Literature. And her novel, Bit of Wormwood, uh, was shortlisted for the Hindu uh, Literature for Life Prize in 2013, which now she has received this year for her latest novel that was published in 2014, that is uh, 
it's yeah, sleeps. Now <clears throat> I'll just read a few more lines about her. Uh, she is one of the more pro prolific and sensitive writers coming from the Northeast and her life has been intimately connected with the trouble and trauma of the Nagar struggle for independence, personal and otherwise. She is widely translated into many languages as we have heard and she is also co-founder and a partner of Bach Weaver which is a publishing house that publishes Naga Folk Tales. She has a PhD in English Literature from Pune University and she worked for a while as a lecturer in the Department of English in Nagaland University. We have heard that she performs jazz poetry with her band Jack po uh, Jazz Poesy which she is going to demonstrate also for us. And with this, as I said, is going to be an interesting session. I don't want to take up too much of her time. But I also want to mention that she has translated over 200 oral poems and many more short stories and tales from her native language, Teneyedi, that is the Angami, into English. And as an experienced translator, she is of the belief that the translator translates not only the speech patterns, but the thought patterns of the author. Now, if you will permit me, sir, I'll just take five more minutes, because I feel that uh, I should just say a few short words about some of her major works here. She's written, unless I'm very wrong, to my knowledge, she's written six solid novels, one of them being a novella, and of course, one solid book, which is also, um, not fiction, it's non-fiction collection of her essays and writings, articles. Mm -hmm. Now this novel, Village Remembered, uh, which was published by Ura Academy in Kohima, uh, it was published in 2003, and we have heard that it is an important landmark in Naga literary history. It is actually a historical novel that gives an account of the various wars of Konomo village, you know, where a brave band of, a uh, small band of Naga warriors defended that village. It is a historical novel. And then finally, the major battle of Konoma of 1879 to 1890, and she has kind of woven a fiction around this. So the close reading of this novel also reveals very intimate details of the cultural life of a Naga village. Then we have a terrible matriarchy, uh, which we have in our course for some time. Also, now we will be changing. This is published by Zuban. It's a thought-provoking tale of a young Naga girl, Delelo, who from the age of five is sent out to live with her strict paternal tradition-bound grandmother who wants her to grow up to be a good Naga wife and mother. Narratives that reflect old beliefs and patriarchal traditions and the eerie presence of the dead are skillfully woven with the new faith and the onslaught of an underground movement. Then we have Mari. I think this by far, uh, maybe, I don't know, later on she will tell us. Uh, this is published by Harper Collins, 2010, Mari. And in fact, later on, uh, during the question session, maybe I also want to pose whether this is, you know, part biography, part fiction, how, what kind of work would we call this? Because it goes back in history to Kohima of the war years of the 1940s. It is a sensitive retelling of a true story narrated in the first person by Marie. It tells of a different Kohima ravaged by war and the Japanese invasion. It's people like Marie and her siblings who have fled and who had to survive as best they can until reunited again with their parents at the end of the war. Then we have Life on Hold by Bach Weaver and Ura Academy, 2011. This is a novella, it's a short uh, piece of work, uh, <clears throat> and it tells of the troubled years of the Naga struggle for independence. It takes the author just a few scenes and brief conversations to reveal and unravel Naga life with admirable accuracy. The novella works equally well as a symbolic narrative to how life is put on hold or kept in abeyance, as it were, so that others could 
pursue a dream, could pursue an ideology. Then we have Peter Wormwood of 2011, published by Zuban in Delhi. This novel gives a poignant insight into life lived in conflict. In a maelstrom of violence that ends up ripping the Naga community into factions. A conflict that has lasted decades and in the process scarred the landscape and brutalized the people of Nagaland. The bitter wormwood is a herb traditionally believed to ward off evil spirits and it becomes a powerful talisman that is longed for now for the trying times. Then we have this really wonderful collection, it's called Thoughts After Easter uh, 2014. It's a collection of articles and essays on varying subjects, uh, ranging from articles of social and environmental concern to the deeply personal and spiritual. All the articles have been formally published in newspapers and journals. I love this piece. Did your first Christmas cake come out of an ammunition box also? You'll have to read this. It's a telling piece. Uh, that bears evidence to the writer's sensitivity and her restrained way with words that embeds several unspoken narratives. Then we have her last work. In fact, it's a great book. It's called When the River Sleeps. We have in our library at the department. 2014, published by Zuban. The reader along with the hunter Billy is taken into the remote mountains of Nagaland, alive with natural wonder and supernatural enchantment, to find the sleeping river of his dreams, from which he has to wrest a stone that will give him untold powers. It is a powerful narrative that tells, that tells of the lives of a people immersed in rituals and old beliefs, and their close-knit communities who live in harmony the setting provided for the solitary hunter who will leave all of this driven by the mysterious pull of a dream. In fact, critics have called it, uh, it's written in the tradition of magic realism as some would see it. Uh, anyway, with this, I hand over the <coughs> forum to uh, history. Uh, I'm sorry to have taken up some of your time, but uh, I, you know, it's a chance I just cannot pass by because I know many of those uh, sitting here may not read your works, but I thought they should have an idea of the kind of talent and the range of your writing that is available. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in Mizoram. This is my first time, and you've heard about my adventure yesterday. It was really exciting. There was a huge storm in Calcutta uh, Airport, thunder, lightning, the words, and, and then almost missing my flight. And when I sat down, they closed the doors and started the aircraft. So I was just sitting there saying, thank you, God, I can actually get to this one. It, it is like coming to heaven because Canberra was hot, it was 38 degrees, it was hot, and you know the traffic and people are unpleasant and to come here, land, and so much greenery, everything's peaceful and that big cross in the garden, the, the big cross out at the airport, that's the first thing you see. It just, it just felt so magical and so heavenly. So I'm really, really enjoying my time here and thank you for inviting me. I have a lot of uh, connections to Mizoram, which I'll, I'll just, to Aizol in particular, which I'll just briefly tell you about. My grandmother's, my maternal grandmother's brother, the younger brother, he fell in love with a beautiful Mizor girl and he came here and married her. In Aizol. So I'm hoping to see the church where they got married. Then um, my brother in law's father was born here, so the local people named him Zopiana. So, so he still has that name. He's given that name to his children and grandchildren. So people always ask them, Oh, you guys are Mizo. So there's this story to tell, you know, um, people who 
who ask in every generation, we always tell them the story of how he, his father came to work here and he was born here. It, it's wonderful connections like that. Then my mother, because her first cousins were half Mizo, she learned to speak the language and then uh, Diki came to Koyama and learned to speak in Gami. So there's this intertwining of families and languages. I think that's such a beautiful thing. I wish I wish I could learn Mizo at, at some point <laughs> in this life, this other side. Uh, and so my mother is now 84, so she's, um, she just sits there talking about the old days. And now Mizo folk tales are coming up from her memory. So uh, the other day I was listening to this beautiful story about where tiger, um, uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't tell you, it's going to become a book. It's so magical. And um, the thing with um, my mother is you have to probe her and then ask her about the story. And she will tell the story several times. But every time, more details come up. So like you were, uh, somebody was saying, there's so many layers. And you have to um, be so lucky when you get all the layers. Up. Yeah, and yeah, many more things to say, but I, I'll, I'll just uh, give you my speech and then. But thank you so much, Margaret, for that abstract on my books. It helps very much. I don't have to talk so much about myself now. Uh, last year we were uh, celebrating my 25th book because I also write uh, children's books. And my first children's book, I wrote it in Norwegian. But um, after that, I just stick to English because um, it's faster in English. And you don't need somebody to go through your language and your grammar. Um, yeah. To uh, Sheri said, Lante said, uh, she would like me to talk about my, my writing. So I'm going to limit myself to that. And I want to acknowledge my debt to the African writers, the Nigerians like Junior Achebe, Amos Tutuala, Ben Okri, all, all the names that you are familiar with, and also Kenyan writer Ngugi, Ngugi Wathiongo. These were the uh, writers I discovered at university, and their work inspired me to, to dive into my own tribal world because um, I, I realized that you could write novels about another life or about tribal life. And that's, that's what I long to do and I've been able to do that. So it's um, opening up, opening up the physical and spiritual universe of the Angamis to the rest of the world. It's, it sounds very ambitious, but I take it as a life calling. So um, it's not a duty. It, it's really very enjoyable and, and fun as well. And I also want to acknowledge the oral storytellers amongst my people. Uh, they're the ones who taught me that even <coughs> if we did not have a written literature at some point in history, we've always had We've always had our own literature, and uh, it was storytelling, stories that were conveyed from generation to generation. So that's what we had. So these people reminded me of, the, or taught me about the world we've always had. And um, that leads to this other point that I want to make. Um, <clears throat> listening to the, the speaker this morning, the Padmashree, uh, speaker, um, th there's so many connections, and he brought up uh, narratives of other people, and they show how those outsiders defined us, the British anthropologists, for instance, who <coughs> were the first to write about us. So we've always been defined by other people, and at some stage we had accepted those definitions the stereotypes that oh, the, 
people of the northeast, these hills, they're so barbaric, barbaric savages. This is what you find when you go through the writings of, um, of that period. And our forefathers, they accepted that, that narrative. So the definitions have continued for quite a long time. And now, I, I know we're doing it, we've already started to do it, but it is high time if, if there are some who haven't, that we resist those definitions of us by others, and we define ourselves. And we also, it's, it's time to take pride in who we are, because, uh, oh yes, I, I found something very uh, interesting in the Bible. Uh, when I was thinking about this point, there's a verse that said, don't uh, compare yourself to others. You are an original. <laughs> and, and this is this really took me aback. Come on, this is the Bible. And how do you find such a verse there? But it is there. So uh, that, that is a point that I want to make. We are originals. We should not try to imitate somebody else. We should not think we are less because our culture is different from others. Etc. I hope you agree with that. We are. We have to keep reminding ourselves we are asli, not roughly. <laughs> then I want to come back to what I'm trying to do with my novels, and it is uh, this um, task I've set myself to chronologize the social, cultural, and historical life of my people, the Agamis in a more permanent form, and that more permanent form is written literature, or I, f I feel that written literature offers that. So uh, the books that uh, Margaret has um, summarized, they do that, beginning with uh, another village remember, which is about warrior, the warrior culture, 1800s. Then um, Mari, and then uh, you, you've already seen that Mari, and then Bitter Homewood, which I have not brought, then Terrible Majority. So um, another village remember is set um, for in 1800s, but it stops at 1900. Then Mari is set in 1942, and then it carries on through the 40s. Uh, Terrible Majority covers um, the 60s and 70s, and uh, the novella, Life and Hold, uh, covers the 80s and 90s. So, and, and Peter Wormwood stretches from 1937 to 2007. So, the chronology, that, that's how it appears for me in my head. Um, something very interesting this morning was that uh, the date, 1890, was when the British were having their expeditions here, or their punitive raids here in the Mizo Hills and trying to quell, quell the um, raids by Mizo warriors in, uh, uh, and Mizo headhunters. And uh, I'm just sitting there thinking, that's, so that's what they were doing after they finished with the Nagas, you know? <laughs> Because 1879 to 80 is the recorded, last recorded battle with the Nagas. And it was, they had conquered most of the territory and it was just this little warrior village left. 500 warriors. That's, that's not a big number at all. But the British couldn't, uh, they just could not um, get rid of them. They kept burning down the houses, plan after plan, and the villagers would come back and rebuild it, and then go into Assam, take revenge by taking a few heads again. So it was this cat and mouse game. Finally, the British brought in elephants and cannons and troops from Manipur, and, and also from the rest of, uh, it became 2,000 soldiers, foot soldiers, then all the cannons, and they just bombed that village. And even then, there were a few warriors who left the village by night, and they went up the hills, and there was a fort. 
So they entrenched themselves into this fort. And when the British came after them, they rolled down rocks. So, so in the end, the uh, British pride was dented and they agreed to a treaty. Therefore, the people of the village, they like to say that they were never defeated, but a treaty was enacted. It's, it's very interesting history. Uh, and for me, it's doubly interesting that our histories are so intertwined. You know, if you look at the dates, 79, 80, there's a big battle with Konoma, and then they come here and then start again. But then that brings me to the uh, to, to something that uh, I discovered was very interesting. It is uh, working with oral memory. I've worked with several oral narrators. They're the ones who gave me the stories. And you know, oral memory can be uh, selective, but not deliberately selective. So what happened was these um, narrators who had never been to school, they would always um, center their narratives around certain wars. So that, that was the oral method of telling time. And very casually, they would be talking to me and say, oh, that was during the war. Then I'd have to ask, which war? Because there were three wars. If it was somebody in his 80s, he would be talking about the Second World War, the, the Japanese invasion. We always call it the Japanese invasion. Somebody in his 60s and above would be talking about the Indonado War. And then somebody from the village of Konoha would be talking about the Battle of Konoha. So the wars, these were always the memory markers for, for oral narratives. And it's interesting that it's also used by the, the African the Zimbabweans. My Zimbabwean friend was told by his mother, uh, you were born in the, in the year of the railroad. <laughs> and uh, that year was 1956. So these little things that we share, but they're, they're just interesting, so I, I, I'm bringing it up. Um, now the village, remember, is much, much about um, warrior culture, and the people are no longer like that, but when we had the warrior culture, it hardened, it callous the, the men and the women. Even the women were so hard, and the women, the, the best compliment they would have gotten was, oh, you're just like a man. So, you want to talk about feminism? Go back to the <laughs> warrior period. These are the real feminists. Something interesting about Naga village, remember, was uh, it was translated to Swahili. It never got published, but my Swahili translator said it was so easy to translate because it was like talking about and writing about my own village. So this is something we should think about. We should think about translating um, Miso uh, novels to Angami, and then um, Nago novels, which m mostly are in English, so that translation will be easy. You could think about translating that into Miso. Just, just a suggestion because of the shared shared culture, the, the head hunting. Of course, we are supposedly more enthusiastic about head hunting than the Mizos, but the Mizos also had that, you know? So, <laughs> so I'm, sure, I'm sure this will be a very interesting project. And there are many, um, or some organizations that, um, that promote, promote um, translations of this sort. Uh, two sentences about Marie. Um, she was my mother's sister, my aunt, and I think you would have remembered her. Yeah. Um, it's it's the story of Marie. Yes, it's the story of because her picture is there on the cover, and it's a very personal story. It's uh, like going through her diary, but it's also the story of Kohima. And I wonder how many have been to Kohima when they see something. Okay. Yeah, okay. 
okay, not, not the students. Yeah, so you're all invited to Koheva. <laughs> Um, I always want to apologize if people come to see Kohima now because it's so changed from the Kohima of Mari's days. She and my mother, they were my informants, they were my, the, the oral narrators that I used. And they told me back in the day there were only two cars on the road and a motorcycle. So one car was driven by the district commissioner. Um, an Englishman called Posse, and the other car was used by the, the American missionary Sapri. And I was very curious who was riding the motorcycle. And that was also by the missionary. <laughs> and the rest of the people, like the officers, what did they use? They used horses. So it's it's sort of unimaginable even for me. But think of children of today. We have such tremendous uh, traffic jams. So if I tell them, there was a time, imagine, in my mother's day, there were only two cars on the road, and their jaws just <laughs> fall. Mari wanted me to write this story for a very long time. She started to tell me when I was 16, and uh, only much later it did it become reality, and she would keep asking me, uh, when, when is that book coming out? When is that book coming out? I want to see it before I die. When she turned 80, 85, I got really worried. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then the publisher, Harper Collins, they actually liked it and we worked on it and got it published. So she got to see it and she passed away last year, 2015. But I think this has become a very, um, a, become a book that touches the, the younger generations very much. I had a little girl um, from class six. She was just about 11, 12 years old. She came up to me and she said, I love the book, Mari. I just love the, the love story. <laughs> She's like that. <laughs> so people like it for different reasons. I'm just grateful that they like it. You are familiar with Terrible Majority. This is part fact or fiction, and uh, it's um, Kohima 50 odd years ago. So, uh, and, and people get confused because it says matriarchy, but of course, uh, it, a gummy structure, a gummy society structure is very much patriarchy. So it's about the perversions the perverted use of patriarchy and the abuse of gender within the same gender. Um, some very interesting things happened when I was doing this reading in Germany because they have the German translation. A, a woman came up to me after the reading and she just said, this is me. <laughs> this is my story. And she was about 50 years old, she said. My grandmother used to treat me just like this girl. So it's it's got that, um, I guess you could call it universal element, that women 50 years ago, or a little more, they, their position was not so good, and the struggle for education, all that. It's not just restricted to here, to Norris, India, but other people can connect with it. I, I like that very much. Bitter Womb, what you know, is, is um, the story of the Naga freedom struggle. And the book ends with a step towards peace. And that peace is initiated by the third generation. Because people say that in the first generation, the people who fought, they have too much blood guilt, too much blood on their hands. So it's not possible for peace to come through them. And at home, there are some very honest people who keep saying, the whole lot has to die out, and then only peace will come up. Then only solution has to come. But, okay, we won't discuss that. I don't like politics. But um, this book, some reviewers have given the conclusion that um, it's an idealistic uh, book because it proposes a human solution to a political problem.
Um, life on hold is set in the 80s and 90s. I had a very interesting experience with this. It's a novella, so when I sent it to my usual publishers, Zuban, they were not so interested. Harper Collins was not, not interested either. So Mark Weaver published it, and guess what? <laughs> the the novel market just loved it, especially adolescents, because it was about three young people, and uh, it was about things happening around them. And the three friends, they grow up. As they grow up, a girl, a girl and two boys. The girl falls in love with with one of the boys, who is the bad boy, because he decides to drop out of school. Plus nine, ten, ten. After ten, he just drops out. He goes off and joins one of the underground factions. But he's also dashing and handsome, and she falls in love with him. They meet up again after he's joined. But by then, he says, I'm a condemned man. It'll, it'll be like, you, you're just going to be a widow if you marry me. So she gives up the dream, and eventually he dies. So it's like the Naga Romeo and Juliet <laughs> story. And uh, it, it's become a, a bestseller within Nagaland. And that's why I want to say, don't believe everything your publisher tells you, or your agent, because, or your editor, because they don't know the market like you do. They don't know your readers like you do. You're the one who knows what your readers want to read. And uh, you should become the deciding factor. I think we give too much. Don't tell my publisher I said that. I think sometimes I think we give too much power to publishers or to some other authority to decide over us. So it all ties up with defining, accepting definitions or resisting definitions or resisting labels. Yeah, so that was interesting. Then uh, the children's books. Uh, okay, children's books. Um, we have no. Or, or some years ago, we had no children's books written by Naga writers. So I s decided to just switch back to English and write in English. One was uh, The Log Drama Boy. And uh, <clears throat> it's an interactive book. Because the log drum features very much in Naga culture, especially in the Aal, the Santan, etc. But Children and also grown-ups are ignorant about what it is. So just wrote a short story about it and go to schools. Then we let, help them to do this, uh, the, the different beats of the drum and tell them what they are. So there's a slow beat, there's a fast beat, there's a really fast beat. beat. Then there's a very slow beat when, when somebody has died. And the children love to bang on their fists because that becomes their long drum. So we've done that and we're still continuing to do that. But it's so nice that you can um, pass on the teaching of culture in a playful way. Um, yeah. Then I am still continuing to do poetry, continuing to write poetry and do volumes of poetry. Recently, um, the Bengali, Bengali translation of my book, Just Projects, come out. Um, then, um, I'll, I'll just say two more sentences. What I feel that my writing is about is uh, addressing the silences. We've had a lot of silences in, in our society, and these silences came in different times. When we had oral uh, storytellings, the storytellings would take around the take place around the herd. A grandparent would tell the story, but everybody would be seated around the fire. But this uh, setting was displaced because we had army occupation, burning of villages, burning of homes. So this was totally destroyed, and that created a big silence. Um, even when the people ran off into the 
forests to hide. Children were taught not to move, not to make any noise. So that was another <coughs> silence that was uh, that, that happened in, in the past. So that's one silence. Then the voice of the girl child has always been silent. Therefore, gender neutrality opens up the voice or gives voice to the girl child. Then even in the world of academics, we have been very silent for a long time, which is only in the 70s that we've had now scholars coming out and writing about themselves. Always been written about, never had the chance to write about themselves. So these silences, uh, silences imposed by double colonization, these are the silences that I, I, I've been addressing in my writing. And since um, the seminar also touches on the question of identity, from the other side, this has always been a crisis because colonization and crisis of identity, they go together, they go hand in hand. Before 1947, we were called uh, the British subjects because we knew that. Then after 1947, we were forced into the Indian Union. So if you sit writing on a form and it says nationality, you can't write Naga, you have to write Indian. So it came to a point where to be a Naga was illegal and you, you, were, you were illegal if you were a Naga. And this lingering illegitimacy has affected us um, psychologically. Um, so much so that uh, we, we're not aware of how deeply it's affected us. Um, at the same time, uh, we, um, I really want us, not just now us, but all the Northeasterners, to avoid victimhood. Because I've seen that in other societies, other indigenous societies, and it's, it's, really, it's really not good. Uh, because victimhood sees uh, demons where there are no demons. It demonizes where there are no demons. And it's always sitting there in a corner and be feeling a lot of self-pity. And we know that. We, we're much more than that. I think I'll stop there. And uh, what I'd really love to do is to dance with you. This is um, my latest children's book. It's called The Dancing Village. And uh, it's about one of the components of uh, culture, our, our Northeastern cultures is about dancing. There is a particular now trend for the Zenians who are very good at dancing. And the dance is not just a dance, it is, uh, it is a story told in dance. They divide into two groups, a group of singers, and the second group is the dancers. So the singers are singing a story to which the dancers dance, and when they make gesticulations, they're dancing out the story. It's, it's so beautiful. Uh, I, I think we are so fortunate to have this, because I know the, the Mizopanche has a lot of this. You probably have it much more than the Nagas. Um, this is about a boy who loves to dance, and he learns, learns to dance because his mother is a Zelian, but his father is an owl. So the father's side tried to prevent him from dancing. But he loves it so much he dances in secret. And, uh, and uh, lastly, I want to say that we, uh, we are all books. All of us are books. We are living books. And the older people among us are our books of history, our books of culture. And all of us, the stories that we carry with us makes us books. And now let's become dancing books. <laughs> So, we don't face this way, but uh, demonstrate it's the same as face this way and um, stand with your feet apart. And it's one, two, one, two, and try to reach the end. One, two, one, two. Jump and swing your arms. So, remember, it's just one, two, one, two, swing your arms, reach here, and then we all turn back. And, and go in this direction. And I know you can all do it. I'm not going to ask you to do it. Let's start. <laughs> okay. 
books that people can read when they're waiting in the traffic to be Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I just yes. want to make uh, some comment then. So the thing is like in your talks, like I, I take three important points. I feel like that touched me so much. Like outside of define us, but it's time to define ourselves now. I get it that one. And the second one is silent imposed by colonialization. Right? So victimization of norms. <coughs> These few words, but currently is kind of revitalization of who we actually are, right? So can you emphasize a bit on that thing? Okay. It's not victimization, it's victimhood, okay. which is different from victimization. Because victimhood is always seeing yourself as a victim, and it's like putting yourself in a box. So the only person who can help you out of the box is yourself. And uh, many indigenous communities, they do this. And what the government does is, okay, I'll give you the example of the Sami people in Norway. They had uh, linguistic separation. They all had to learn Norwegian. So now they, they, there are many writers, many artists, but uh, they have, they have not gotten rid of victimhood. They have many, many opportunities now because the government has been trying to write that. And they're called the minority groups. So if a job comes out, the preference is always given to a woman or somebody from a minority community, which is from the Sami. Um, but but um, they're not satisfied with that. I'm sorry to state that. And also, any action that the government takes, even if there's no um, intent of victimizing them, somebody or the other will, will uh, practice victimhood by saying this goes against our culture or that goes and government has tried to do this. So there is victimhood and uh, we have to be very aware that we're not getting trapped in that. Um, the other thing was colonization and identity. Uh, that for Navas we've been doubly colonized, so we have uh, we, we have a fractured identity, and uh, the fractured identity means uh, for for a long time we were under two different, and we still are under two different powers. So our legal identity that always comes into conflict with our real identity. For, for us, we are a nation in our heads. That's the thing. So nationalism, this is too long a topic. Let's meet <laughs> afterwards. And the, the other one was, uh, oh yeah, uh, def defining definitions. Definitions are actually uh, stereotypes. Somebody would say, could say, um, Nagas are lazy, you know, or Mizos are lazy. That's a stereotype. That's a definition of you. Are you going to accept that or are you going to resist that? It's up to you. So we have to be very careful of what kind of definitions we receive and we permit. Since now we have the authority to allow or to resist. I hope that answers your questions. We invite some more. Yes, from, from this side. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, I think I appreciate whatever you said, but I think you were a point, there is a little exaggeration, I think in a lighter side, let me say. I have visited this uh, Kohima city for three, four times. But I cannot imagine Kohima city with two cars and one bike. You know, like a creature made me that one. And if that was the fact, did you make any composition as a point for that particular, for that great change, you know? And so there's, I'm just, uh, this is, I'm just asking that. Uh, thanks very much for that question. Um, this was a period 75 years ago, so I did not witness it, and I was using the memories of my mother who was 12 at that time 
and my uncle was 16 at that time. 75 so, years ago. Yeah, yeah, so I feel sad. I never saw that going Did you make any composition? No, no. Yeah, there's a, there's a novel and money yeah. on it. But of course, the missionary wrote a song, which is in the book, and most of the Koima people can sing that song. Just uh, one question. Uh, in your writings, of course, I have never read your books, which I will. <laughs> but from the light of, from the, light of you know, like, uh, the person who wrote, you know, uh, can your writings be seen as, uh, you know, anti-national to the more, you know, they, or, you know, we're talking about this now, so, uh, uh, or to the more mainstream, you know, to reflect upon our past in order to know who we really are as, you know, part of the region to you know, our society. And, uh, uh, and another one is, uh, 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 I was a little bit, you know, like I was asking a, uh, like Norway, you know, like why Norway? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, does that have anything to do with your writing, or you know, like is your writing influenced by where you are right now, or something? You know, because the more you move away from your place, the more affinity you have with your place. You know, that that, that thing is there. So, can you please share some light on that? No, that's that's nice. Uh, the second question. Um, see, it's very difficult to find space to write uh, in India, uh, and that space I'm able to find in Norway. And also, my experience with that was that I became more objective when I left geographically, because then, um, then you're out of the situation and you're able to see it from outside. So I think that's very important for a writer because as long as we're in the situation, we're so subjective. Uh, yeah, and then um, the entity becomes bigger. It's it's not just Naga Naga Naga, but grows to uh, more east. And for me, that's that's very important. Uh, then, what was your other question? Oh yeah. <laughs> Which party are you? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, I can say that, you know, like, uh, you know, most of, especially yeah. now the situation in Nagaland, you know all that. And, because we know that. and uh, you know, sometimes, you know, writing a lot, of course, uh, your writings would actually help a lot of youth, of course, and uh, the younger students know about their past. Uh, but are you in any way, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, you know, like, that's your wife or different. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's why I answered your first, your second question first, because to write a book like Better World War, to write about the political movement of the Nagas, you need to write it objectively, and um, I, I, I think I managed to do that by moving away from from the context. Yeah, but um, I think. Somebody or the other would always come up and call me anti-national. If they mean that I'm anti-India, they, they can easily find things there. But uh, as a writer, we write the history, or try, by using our narratives. We try to write the, the history as accurately as possible. Thank you, thank you so much. I find it anti international <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Uh, there's a question. Uh, you were talking about the government of democracy, and uh, you were um, also talking about the colonization. So, do you think that, um, so before that, a lot of writers? Subjectivity is 
Sorry, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. Do you think that post-Bologna subjectivity, which uh, a lot of writers have been, you know, talking about, possible for people of the north, is since we're talking about double colonization? I think that's a PhD question. <laughs> That's a very big question. I can't just answer it off the cuff. But very good question. Just stick to it and, and write your page on it. <laughs> okay. I think uh, the writer reserves the right to uh, not to answer. Yeah. <laughs> this will be the last question. First, um, I don't really how, know how to frame my question. But just, uh, I'd just like to comment that I love your books and Mar, you make me cry so much. <laughs> um, you were talking about how colonialism and cri uh, crisis of identity goes hand in hand. So as people belonging to a region which, you know, which was formerly colonized, how do you suggest or um, what do you suggest we do to find ourselves or our real identity? from something I wrote about identity. I'll look to exactly identity. See, um, if this will be helpful for you, it's about labels and about not accepting labels. And because when you start to accept labels, you put expectations upon yourself and expectations put you inside a box and they clip your creative ways. So you should resist labeling, resist being defined, resist the boxes. Why? Because we are not commodities. See, only commodities belong in boxes and we're not. And so you should be subject to commoditization. And our individual selves are many parts that come together to make a whole. We are complex human entities made up of wondrous material, both spiritual and physical. And we are more, we are here on earth to be so much more than to just fit in. We are here to experience life in its most splendid extremities. Our minds are shackled by definitions of how we are supposed to think or react. So transcend that and confound reason. And you can't do that from a box, from inside a box. I hope that in a roundabout way answers your question. Thank you so much, Mr. Reed. I think we have had a really, really wonderful session and uh, I'm privileged to be the one to be chairing this. Really, it's, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. You know, and I am so happy, I don't know how to express it, because I've always been, I think I've, I've been one of the first people who have started reading history many years back. And in fact, we'll end this session, because we've spoken so much about uh, novels also. Uh, history, if you don't mind, I just have a piece here of a poem that touched me so much that I brought it into one of the articles. This was way back in 2008 when I was an associate in uh, Institute uh, of Advanced Study in Shimura. And over there, we had our seminars. And when I read this and wrote about this, one of the participants, he's a very senior, he was a fellow there at the Institute. You have heard of him, Chandra Namade, the famous Marathi novelist who has had his works translated into English also. He's a nativist, by the way, you know, kind of revivalist who goes in for vernacular literature in a very strong way. So he requested me and he said, can I translate this into Marathi? So I said, uh, I don't know, but I gave, her, I gave him, you know, the department of uh, English uh, phone number and so on. So I don't know if he got to you, but later on he sent me the Marathi version. This is, Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. It's a poem of long ago. But, you see, again, it's talking about the conflict of uh, Nagaland and something that uh, historian had just touched on. Because, you see, the on-off ceasefire between India and Nagaland does not denote the cessation of killing. 
So factionalism and infighting among rival groups of the Naga army continue to claim many lives. So it is with a hard and numb cynical, cynical tone, this is just my view, my reading, that she writes of the brutal gunning down of a member of a rival group whose killers justify their act in a perverted twist of the Christian faith. So if you want, you can just say a few words about this, but the impact of this poem is so strong that I wanted to share with the audience today. Yeah, please, if, if the poet, if the poet herself can read it out. This is 2004. You're right, it's very cynically written. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. I've got him in my sight. And there's a kid on his right, clinging to his hand, and there's a young woman on his left, in her jeans and blue t-shirt. Hmm, pretty. Must be his wife, the Kipaga. Damn, they're going into a shop. There's very too many people. But what the heck is the enemy? Does it matter if a few get hurt too when we've got our man? Okay, Gaia, this is for all the others, and this one is for Nagaland. Nagaland for Christ, remember? Praise the Lord, we've eliminated another traitor. Uh, now, just for the last bit, I'll, it's, I think it's my privilege as someone who has said, I have one question. Uh, you have written so well, so beautiful, so sensitive and also uh, you've written a lot now. What is the work you enjoy most? I don't know if there is any particular book. Was it Marie or was it, you know, the children's books? By the way, we have a lot of children's books also. We have in our library because I just thought one day some of our students might like to dabble in researching the children's writing also. So we have them. So can you just tell me uh, if there's any of your works that you really enjoyed writing, and if so, why? I'll have to say that uh, for the moment, that this is my favorite book. <laughs> but, but not because it won the prize. Of course, I'm delighted it won the prize. But because uh, there's no historical constraint, it could have taken place anytime, anywhere, in the hills, of course, and by a river. So, and uh, it's, my mo it's my favorite setting is the forest. Forest with the forest spirits and all kinds of spiritual creatures, magical creatures, which we have everywhere in the Northeast. And then you can do so much, your imagination is just set free. So I, I would consider this my favorite. Okay, this is followed by another simple question. <laughs> is there anything in your Naga lore or, you know, legend of mythology that talks of a sleeping river. You know, this is about a sleeping river. And while it sleeps and it is still, you have to wrest a stone from within its, which is from the bed, the river bed. And if you can get it out, then you are empowered to be or to do anything. <coughs> so is there anything in the Naga uh, folklore or something that speaks of this that you have borrowed or alluded to? Yes, I got it from a hunter's tale, and uh, I have many hunter friends, so they would always tell me about this. Not a particular river, but any, any river which falls asleep at a certain time at night, it could be two in the morning. So you have to go and wait and wait, and then it falls asleep, maybe for fractions of seconds, and that's when, when people get the story. So, yes, and then there are people who use stones, charm, charm stones, and they believe that one of the most famous Angami poets had a stone which attracted women. Yeah. <laughs> which attracted women. Yes, yes, so he was so successful with the babies. <laughs> and then, yeah, and some keep their stones in the granaries and the grain mountain guys. So there, there is a belief. You know, we have a similar hunter story, Chongpin Leri, a spirit of the wild, it's a beautiful lady, and when hunters move out, some of them, when they uh, move away from their hunting party and move on, then they meet up with this spirit woman, and they fall in love with her, 
and they stay on, and then they can kill any kind of bees. They, they become very, very competent in hunting down any kind of bees. So these hunter laws are very interesting. Yeah, yeah because it's, it's our wealth. Yeah, uh, folklore and all these stories, they are our wealth. And we should protect them and we should pass it on to the next generation. Okay, friends, I think we could go on and on. My, you know, my head is just full of so many things. But I'll share it with her only. Later. Thank you so much. We can move out for lunch now.